a um, he had a, a unplanned event that he had to attend to this morning. So I'm stepping in um, and trying to fill his shoes this morning. I will do the best I can just to give you a brief overview of who we are. And then after that, we'll jump in um, with our program directors, myself, Jackie and Holly, and giving you more of a um, in-depth look of, of what each program does here um, at the CAP agency. So without further ado, I'll just let you know that um, the CAP agency is actually a, a national organization. So the CAP agency was put into motion uh, back in 1964, um, signed uh, by the legislation by Lyndon B. Johnson um, on his war on poverty legislation. So there are over a thousand CAP agencies around the country, uh, us being one of them. Um, and then there are obviously a, a, a CAP agencies spread throughout the state of Minnesota uh, and we work together um, uh, as an organization through MinCap. Uh, so, and that's, those are um, coordinations that are very important for us when we're trying to uh, uh, address the needs within our communities. Uh, the CAP agency has over 26 programs. I'm not gonna list them all, but I will just let you know um, that we have uh, programming in crisis intervention, food and nutrition, education, um, safe and stable housing and community outreach. So today we should cover most of those areas. Um, and of course we're open to, to any questions that uh, any of our FISH partners have today about CAP. Um, just to review our mission and vision, um, our, our mission as stated on our website is to assist and empower people to achieve social and economic well-being by providing services in partnership with our communities. And our vision is aligned to that, to create strong community with healthy individuals, families, quality education, safe and affordable housing, and a work that dignifies. Um, so that's, that's overall what we do. Um, we're really focused on outcomes. Of course, it can't be a, a perfect measure uh, to try to reach 100% of all outcomes for all areas, but we really wanna make sure that our families and individuals within Scott Carver and Dakota, which is our service area, are stable. Um, that we all can mobilize not only internal resources, but also external resources to try to meet those goals and really to empower our clients. Um, um, our past executive director, Joe Vaughn, used to always say it's not a, it's, it's not a hand down, it's a hand up. So we really want to give that hand up to the clients that we serve and, and make sure that they reach self-sufficiency. So our goal is just to partner with our clients and to really move, move their mission forward and goals forward so they can be uh, successful. So with that said, uh, we have a PowerPoint. So is that something that um, Bethany, you have queued up for us or is it something that I will need to? Okay. All right, so let me, let me get that. Just a moment. Are you able to see my screen? No. Let's try that. Now it's working. Perfect. All right, so uh, again, I'm, I'm Eric Gentry from the CAP Agency. Um, just wanted to let you know that um, the, some of our biggest news is that we're moving. We've been in our current building um, at seven, um, on Canterbury Road there for, for years. And so we're gonna be moving, um, we're still in Shakopee, we're, but we're gonna be moving at the Corn Growers Building, formerly Corn Growers Building. Um, so those of you that know Shakopee well, it's uh, on 101 across from the kitty corner from the uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken over there. We will have uh, two buildings on our footprint there. One will be an admin administra administrative office and the second one will be our um, CAP services building. So that will house our food shelf and also be a place where we meet with all our clients. Um, and recent news is that we are also um, moving our, our thrift store and uh, our, our new name will be Local Imports. And we're gonna be moving into the spot where off of 21, where the, um, the uh, uh, Pier 1 used to be located. We've acquired that spot and we're going to be moving there on, on November 24th. So that's pretty exciting and uh, we look forward to uh, reaching more people and, and helping people with their thrift store needs. All right, so I've already introduced myself, so I won't go through that again. 
Um, so what is housing and emergency services? Um, it really encompasses a lot. There are really five main areas that I oversee. Um, emergency housing, supportive housing, our cap housing portfolio, energy assistance program, which, which we know um, here internally is EAP, and continuum of care is something we're involved in uh, locally and regionally. Um, so I will warn you, there are a lot of acronyms in the world of housing. Um, so I've tried to spell out every acronym, but if you have questions, feel free to put it in the chat or, or raise your hand and, and ask what it means. All right, so jumping into emergency services, this is a program that really we're trying to uh, focus on an immediate housing crisis. So as many of you know, in Scott County um, and Carver County and, and somewhat Dakota County, there are no brick and mortar shelters for folks to, to help move into a shelter if they're experiencing homelessness. So our emergency services housing department is really addressing those that are experiencing homelessness or near homelessness. So when I say homelessness, um, those are folks who are either living in their car or they're living in a tent or they're living in, we've had people living in a storage um, locker, um, really places that as HUD defines, um, not, not really for human habitation. So uh, we have folks come to the CAP agency um, for that, assist, for that uh, assistance. And one of our first things that we do is we, we provide an assessment, right? So we sit down with the family or uh, the individual and we do an assessment, a pretty lengthy one, about an hour, an hour and a half, just to get their background to um, ensure that we understand their needs and to make sure that we're really deploying the right services for their needs. So that could be food, that could be um, clothing. You know, many times in the winter, uh, folks have, have showed up at our agency without shoes. Um, sadly. So we will uh, connect people with shoes, we'll connect people with socks, underwear, um, really whatever they need, we try to, to meet that need. Um, you know, and being that we're, we're a housing department, we also have access to some limited motel vouchers. So as the CAP agency, we do fundraising um, through one of our main events, which is Project Community Connect which is uh, an event I'll talk about briefly um, further on, but it's, it's a partnership between Scott and Carver County and CAP Agency. And so we fundraise for these dollars. We also receive some limited dollars from both Scott and Carver County. Um, but this is really how we house people that are living in those areas I'd mentioned earlier, like tents, cars, et cetera, especially in the really extreme weather um, times in Minnesota. So um, when it gets really hot or very cold as it does in Minnesota in, um, you know, late November through through March. So we will assist people and put them in motels, but we also do some what, what I term as prevention. Um, so we do some prevention for those that are near homeless. So people who near homeless is considered people who, let's say, um, fell on some bad times, can't pay their rent or mortgage, they really need that um, just short-term assistance to help them over the hump to, provide, to make sure that they, they keep their housing. So we have a program through the state of Minnesota called FHBAP, another acronym, uh, Family Homeless Prevention and Assistance Program. And we are a subgrantee with Carver County, um, with our partners in Scott County also. And so we will, again, assess folks that call us. We have limited funding, so we can't help everyone who calls us. Um, but we are help, be able to help um, a handful of people every month with the dollars we receive. Um, just wanted to quickly mention an uh, exciting new partner that we have is United Way 211. So in the past, it used to be that the CAP agency does an assessment on folks that come into the agency um, uh, when they first call, but now that folks that are near homeless or experiencing um, um, rent arrears, they will call 211 first to get assessed and get services and then be um, sent back to CAP if, if they indeed are qualified for the FHPAP program. Um, and then I just wanted to mention that we refer folks to all of our uh, 25 other programs. And then we also have some other external partners, um, including the counties that assist us, including Fish Network as was displayed in the three needs that were um, presented in the beginning uh, of the meeting. Our staff loves the Fish Network uh, to list those needs. So. Great resource. Uh, jumping into our second area, supportive housing. This is really the nuts and bolts of our 
uh, funding for people who can't afford housing. So um, you may have some awareness of the rental market and you may not um, in Scott County and Carver County and really in the region, the, uh, rent, the rental vacancy rate has been under 1% for years. Um, it has been a landlord market for um, as long as I can remember. So with that, there's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of demand and not enough housing. So we have people that come to us that are paying 50, 60, 70, 80% of their income towards rent in the area. Um, so there's a great need for rental assistance, or you've heard the term subsidy. We receive funding from both the federal government, HUD, and also the state, um, Minnesota Housing is FHPAP, and we also receive some funding through Department of Human Services for that. Um, our focus really is to help people get into housing, create stability, and um, there's two tracks for that. One is a 24-month program that used to be the old transitional housing model. It's now called rapid rehousing. And then our second track is permanent supportive housing or PSH. And, and that really is um, not only housing, but also services attached to housing to ensure that folks are successful out in the community. So there are some folks that we come across that, that need more than just a roof over their head. They need help um, with some of their daily activities, getting to the doctor, transportation, um, all those things. So um, that's what PSH is. Um, and both of these tracks, we focus on stability and giving the time and the space for all our clients to really work on their individual goals. Um, our funders really want folks to increase their income. And to that end, by increasing income, being able to exit our programs and being able to get into a housing situation on their own and pay their full rent. Um, also, many of these programs want, uh, because they want an increase of income, you need uh, employment. So we work on that. Uh, and then we're really working on recidivism, really making sure that people are not returning to homelessness. Um, you know, there has been, in my experience in the 20 plus years and working in the industry, um, a, a segment of, of the folks that we serve that do come back um, that unfortunately, uh, for various reasons uh, in, their, in their life, um, may exit a program and be successful for a while and then fall on hard times again. So our focus is really to make sure people are, again, we're giving a hand up and they're, they're really able to, um, to, to fish on their own. And then we have family service coordinators at CAP. So that's the service component, um, really just the case management that helps our, our clients become more successful out in the community. Uh, moving along, I wanted to, to talk about CAP housing. So CAP housing has a housing portfolio. Uh, we acquired our units over uh, most of the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, most of our footprint for our housing portfolio is in Dakota County. Um, we do have uh, nine units in Scott County. Uh, one of them is a duplex in Shakopee, which we manage for the Scott County Community Development Agency, the CDA. And then we have our own building over in Savage, which is a sevenplex. Um, and those are all sent to us uh, through a system called coordinated entry. And I'll fill you in exactly what that is moving forward. But um, really we're just serving people that have ex coming out of homelessness. We have an approach which is housing first. So housing first is just really meeting people where they're at. We don't set up barriers. So we have folks that come into our housing that may be um, using um, uh, ke chemicals or uh, uh, illicit drugs. Uh, so, you know, we have rules around that, but we also are meeting them where they're at and making sure they're working towards sobriety while they have some stability in our home. Um, and just one note here that my uh, housing manager who manages this wanted me to, to let you, go, you guys know that we're seeing an uptick in Scott County with single men and the need for housing. So um, most of the folks that are in our property in Savage are single men that have come up through our coordinated entry system. So just more of a note for everybody. We're really excited to add to our portfolio a housing coach. So really just another added, added measure to help our clients in CAP housing become successful, kind of a case management component. Um, uh, as good as Michelle Polson, who is our manager of CAP housing is, she can't do it all. So, and then lastly, we just wanna be good neighbors. So we move folks into our housing. We really try to uh, keep that line of communication open, not only with the surrounding neighborhood, but we have great partnerships with law enforcement um, and uh, community leaders. Uh, so this is really important to us. 
This is just a picture of our uh, Savage property. And again, this is the seven plex that we have. And then this is the CDA property in Shakopee. And this is again, a, a duplex. So it has a two bedroom on the left side and a, and a four bedroom on the right side. All right, so you might be asking, how, do we, how, do, how does someone that I may know or, or am working with access housing? So I mentioned the coordinated entry system. Um, back in the day, it used to be whoever had, uh, whoever had the most resources, whoever was connected to someone at the county or a case manager mm -hmm. or really an advocate got all, got all the resources. Um, HUD five, six years ago put in place coordinated entry. It is a HUD unfunded mandate that we put together as a, as a region and all, air, all continuum of cares around the country have to have this in place. And it really just is a way to create fairness based on need. Um, I won't read the list, but basically there's a waiting list based on a score that uh, someone going through according to entry is uh, placed on the list based on the score. So if you think about it, if you get the highest score, um, you're gonna go into a permanent supportive housing um, program. If you get a lower score, you're probably going to be more on a rapid rehousing shorter term program. Um, I just want to do a quick plug here. I always get the question, what can we do to help housing at CAP? We're always looking for uh, donations, of course, to help our clients, um, especially our motel voucher system. Um, but recently, we're really also looking at gap funding. So those things that our grants can't pay for, um, things like getting a driver's license, driver's license, getting their GED, um, car repair, um, you know, sometimes clothing that we may not have access to. So those things we're always looking to get help. And then lastly, we have housing projects um, for our cap housing um, portfolio. And so if you're looking for a good team builder in the spring or summer, we can, or even fall, I uh, can get you connected with Michelle and we can get your group out there to help us with landscaping or painting or whatever uh, you might want to do with your group. Um, just want to mention energy assistance. It's another uh, program that I oversee. It's a $4 million program that we receive um, funding through the state of Minnesota Commerce Department. Um, we cover uh, energy bills, water, and water is a new program this year with the COVID stimulus dollars. So um, we're able to pay an arrears, you know, those amounts that haven't been paid in their water bills. Um, and I've been told we have probably a couple more months left with the water. It's been a very uh, popular uh, funding stream this year as of October 1 start. Um, we help with utility disconnections or fuel deliveries. So um, some people have propane tanks, some people have electricity, some people have oil. We can help with all of that for folks. Um, and then we also have education. So um, our manager does podcasts that can be accessed on our website. So we have over 300 people that listen to the podcasts on, a, on a, a regular basis during our season. And then we have repair and replacement, which is really kicking up to high gear now that the cold weather is, is upon us. Um, so that is if someone's furnace goes out, they can call us 24 seven and we can get uh, an inspector out there and we can get a, one of our HVAC folks to replace their um, heating component if needed. Um, just a really quick takeaway on energy assistance. It started October 1st and runs through May 31st. And this year, just on this slide, want to point out that we have a lot more uh, money because of the COVID stimulus dollars uh, through the ARPA. So we can pay up to $2,000 in primary heat grants. So again, people who are behind in paying their heat, uh, we can help in that and their electricity. And then we have crisis grants up to $1,200. So a crisis grant would be if someone gets a disconnect notice and their, their electricity will be shut off um, in, in a matter of days, they can contact us and we can assist folks with that. And this is just indicating the, the income eligibility for our EAT program. So this amount is just really the um, uh, how much folks can make within a, a three month period of time. Real quick, want to touch on continuum of care I mentioned is a HUD unfunded mandate again. Uh, and there are 10 COCs in the state of Minnesota. And the one that we're involved in is this one right here. Um, it's the wraparound that, that um, wraparound Ramsey and Hennepin County includes Carver, Scott, uh, Dakota, Washington, and Anoka. And we all work together on homeless planning uh, for the region, but we also have a local um, 
a, a local group that I'll get into called Heading Home Scott Carver. But again, we just do a lot of planning on the regional level and make sure that we are creating a system that if someone goes from Washington to Carver, it's consistent and people have to um, can only go to limited doors and not have to go to five different doors to get services. And then again, Heading Home Scott Carver. Uh, this, this meets on the first Wednesday, uh, virtually right now, um, of the month. We are a, a conglomeration, an a, a entity, as, as you were, of government agencies, nonprofit, faith groups, and we're really working together. We have a 10-year plan in place to end homelessness. Um, obviously, not one agency, not even CAP can do it alone, so we really need to create partnerships and work together. So we have uh, weekly phone calls for Heading Home Scott Carver just to touch base on some of the trends and some of the, the needs in the community. And then we have a monthly meeting um, with which a lot of times we have speakers at. So if you're interested again, let me know and I'll, I'll forward you that information. And lastly, my last slide is just to indicate that I might be in the world of housing, but for me and many others in the industry, it's really about home, right? It's really about making sure people have shelter and stability. Um, housing is the technical term, but home is really, really important. So. Um, yes, I'll put that in the in the chat, Allison, for how to get to the meetings. And with that, any questions? Do you know off the top of your head, Eric, how many households we helped last year with EAP? It's quite a few. I think people are going to be surprised how many people we helped. Yeah, so um, last I heard, uh, last season, so not including the summer season, we had a special COVID summer season, season. We're usually off in the summer and we were operating 12 months out of the year this year. Um, usually our normal season, we, are, we hit about 6,000 people in Scott Carver in Dakota. That's households, right? Households, correct. Yeah. yeah. That's so great. our EAP department is, is never has a dull moment. We're always, always busy, which is good. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I'm gonna pass the baton over to Jackie Lohr, our Director of Nutrition and Community Services. Thank you, Eric. Are you gonna to continue to uh, run the I can stop part? sharing if you, wanna, if you wanna do it. Oh, okay, we could do that. All right, is everyone able to see? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'm Jackie Lara, Director of Nutrition and Community Services. Um, the programs that I oversee at CAP is um, our food shelf, um, both our regular food shelf and then our emergency food shelf in Rosemount, Senior Nutrition, um, SNAP Outreach, CHORE, currently WIC, um, and then also our prevention services, so Crisis Nursery and Parents Helping Parents, um, Esperanza and community projects or holiday programs and backpacks, and then our thrift store local imports. So since Terry is an esteemed board member and has been with CAP for many years, um, I feel I wouldn't do it justice speaking about the programs that she manages. So I will go ahead and let her take over here. Let me thank my... you. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I appreciated learning a lot of stuff from Eric. I used to be in energy assistance. Uh, my coverage was all of Carver County. I processed all of those energy assistance applications. So, um, and then I also was emergency services coordinator for many years. And of course it's changed quite a bit, but we did uh, some of the programs that Eric has talked about and developed within uh, emergency services. And um, since I do like to, uh, Brag, I guess I, I feel proud, I guess I should say, proud that I will be with CAP Agency 32 years as of December 1st. So um, it's very good to, to join you all today. 
I've done many programs, like I've mentioned, with the CAP agency currently. Um, I do manage the chore program for seniors, SNAP outreach, and then uh, new during the COVID uh, the pandemic part of chore does uh, telephone reassurance. So we call all of the seniors that um, have filled out a uh, nutrition assess assessment um, activities of daily living uh, sheet and we are funded by the trellis organization that used to be known as uh, Metropolitan Area Agency on Aging. So some people might know them better as the senior linkage line. Um, they're a huge organization that is funded, uh, funded by the Minnesota Board on Aging and then Congress passes the Older Americans Act Title III funds. So it comes down federally through the state and then we're a designated organization to do that. So that program, uh, we do Scott Carver and Dakota. So I call uh, the seniors, uh, chat with them, ask them if they need uh, further resources. Uh, sometimes they like to chat. Sometimes they're like, you know, I'm good. We, uh, we don't need anything. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And then um, good to know that and they're very, usually very happy that uh, somebody is thinking about them and, uh, and not you know, forgetting about them. So that is part of that uh, program. Um, the other program that I manage is chore program for seniors that is just in Scott and Carver. And um, it's not a big program, but uh, obviously for the people that we do help, it's very uh, helpful. We get a lot of referrals uh, from internally our other CAP programs. Um, a lot of them do come from senior nutrition because they obviously are in that realm of the age uh, has to be 60 or over. We do help uh, people that are under 60 but are on social security disability and they get a waiver program. So that means a uh, public health nurse has done a long-term care assessment and they are vulnerable to be sent to a nursing home because they're low income and they have health impairment. So uh, we do help those people as well. That is something that's funded by CAP and we don't get money from the Title IIIB or Trellis, but obviously we do wanna help those people as well. Um, part of the programs that we do for the CHOR program are cleaning. So we have heavy duty cleaning in their home uh, snow uh, removal, mowing, um, handyman. Uh, we do have some assisted driving program. Um, so we always need volunteers for that. We are always looking, we can also pay people. We call them independent contractors. So uh, if you have any clients or know somebody that would like to help a senior, if they can volunteer, that's great. If they can't and they do need to be reimbursed, mm -hmm. we do pay $16 an hour. Um, it is considered an independent contractor position, so people are paid at that rate. Sometimes we can be a little bit, uh, you know, generous and fluctuate. We do have some um, for-profit uh, snow plowing and mowing, and we're able to say, you know, we realize you can probably, with your professional equipment, clean a driveway in half an hour, and you're not going to want to do it for $8. So we, we understand that. So we can have like a two-hour minimum or just like a flat fee if you do this person $50. So we can be a little bit more creative with the generous funding of Trellis, which is, is very helpful. So I'm always encouraging some of our clients that need to earn a little money. Um, they could do this as a side job. You make your own pretty much with snow. It's got to be done fairly soon. But with the cleaning, with some of the other programs, you know, you can make your own schedule. So that's kind of helpful for some of our clients that um, have a good background check. We always want to make sure that we're putting uh, good people with our vulnerable adults. Um, the other program that I'm in, oh, I wanted to give you just a little bit of stats for that, um, just to see how many people that we do help. Um, for the last federal fiscal year, uh, some of these are duplication of the same clients just because we can help somebody, let's say, with routine cleaning. They might need some driving and they need some mowing. So it's the last federal fiscal year um, for the four quarters was 105 people. For the telephone reassurance, starting from the beginning of this year, I've called 400 seniors. And then for the chore units, which is considered um, either an hour of work is considered a unit or with the handyman, it's one project. So handyman, we could do um, fixing a broken screen door, maybe where we built a ramp this summer, we built a ramp for a senior. So that was all done with a volunteer group. It was kind of funny because one of the 
coordinators was actually um, the former crisis nursery uh, coordinator for the CAP agency. And she was my supervisor for a while. So it was kind of fun to say, oh, hi. Uh, she said, you still work at CAP? And I'm like, oh yeah, it's gonna be hard to get rid of me. And so um, we uh, we were happy that they did so much work, tree trimming, bush. I mean, it's just people tell us all the time what wonderful, wonderful uh, groups that we have, faith-based uh, businesses, youth groups. So that's great. And that was about um, uh, 801 units, if you count all those. For so that's quite a bit of help that were helped in the community. Um, the other program that I manage, um, I've been doing chore. Uh, since 2006. And then for the SNAP outreach, we actually started that federal fiscal year 2007. And we partner with uh, Department of Human Services. And then they in turn, I spoke before about the federal funding coming down through the state. That's also happens that way. So the US Department of Agriculture actually oversees the SNAP um, program, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. That is the new acronym. It used to be called food stamps. People don't get stamps anymore. They get an electronic benefit transfer card. So it's like a gift card. So it's much more um, anonymous. People can swipe their card at the grocery store. Um, and then also they get loaded uh, with the dollars that they're eligible for automatically every month. And then they create their own PIN so that there's less fraud that way. So then they can uh, swipe their PIN and buy it. It's just for food. Um, that is Scott, Carver, and Dakota County. And um, it does go by income, um, but um, it, it also takes into effect deductions. So uh, seniors get medical and housing, and then families that are working, they get 20% of their earned income deducted. Uh, they pay child support, they pay daycare. So it does take into those account, those people that truly, they do it that way. It's a little harder. Uh, energy assistance is kind of nice in a way because it just says, this is how much gross income you could have three months, you're good. Uh, for SNAP, it's a little bit more complicated because they want to really tailor to those people who really have a need for food. So they figure if they take their gross income, do some deductions, then they have to get below the poverty guideline. So um, it is a, quite a necessary program, but obviously it's meant for those people who really, really need help with food. Um, part of our SNAP outreach, we do it, we determine eligibility. So we help people go through the process of how, how they could be eligible, help them apply, help them navigate the county system and then EBT help. So sometimes people don't have problems um, accessing the benefits on their card or they're not sure how that works. So we can help them with that. Just to give a few statistics, this last federal fiscal year, they keep track of how many um, applications we've helped people. It's called the combined application form. We've helped um, 400 and no, 545 new people with an application. And I should mention Maritza Real is um, a family service coordinator and she's been working with this program since she started. And she just celebrated her ninth year with CAP. So I'm lucky to have her as an assistant with this program. And then recently, she's also helping out with our family resource centers, and then also with the backpacks and the holiday programs. Um, she's also fluent in Espanol, which is very helpful. Um, and then part of that, um, uh, 545 new applications, 144 were recertifications. The state really wanted us with this new grant year to help people, they don't want churning. So people fall off of the SNAP program and then they have to reapply. So that's called churning. So people lose their benefits. And so then they gotta get started again. So now we're helping them to recertify so they don't fall off and then have to get started again. Um, the most people that we've helped of that total number, 477 are households with children and 109 are seniors. So we're trying to help those seniors which are on fixed income. Um, we've did 136 presentations and 1,507 um, attended those presentations. That could be at our fair for all sites. It could be at the, um, the uh, farmer's market in Prior Lake that I've been going to. Um, and then a lot of those are on the one-on-one -on -one trainer. So by doing this with you today, we would count this as a presentation but it'd be a one-on-one. -on -one. So when I spread the word to other people, and a lot of it is within the CAP agency, um, I can maximize our power to help people 
to know that they should refer people to us or help them know about SNAP. Sometimes people are like, ah, I don't want to do that. They don't realize how much benefit it could be if they would have that extra free food and it would free up their money for the energy assistance, you know, for their utilities, it would free up for rent. And I, I was mentioning that in our program committee with FISH. Uh, we do help people with FISH with utility shutoffs, but I keep telling them, I always wince a little bit. I'm like, energy assistance, energy assistance, energy assistance. Why don't you want free help from the government rather than asking our donors what they could be uh, donating for things like the car repair, like things that we don't, are not able to help with. So with that, I will uh, stop talking. And if anybody has any questions, you're certainly welcome to call me or Maritza. Perry, there's a question in the chat um, yes. that I'll read. I don't know if you can see it. Otherwise, I can read I can, it. I cannot see it, but you can tell me. Sure. Uh, who would a client call if they want to talk to Cap about filling a chore position for a senior and possibly get paid a small amount? Would be me. They can call me at my direct line, which is up there, 952-402-9835. And I would love to have, I were always short of uh, workers uh, for this program. Um, I do, I did have a school teacher that is a volunteer and I asked her if she could do two seniors instead of one. And she goes, there must be, there's going to be a special place in heaven for me. And I said, um, I think so. And I said, I'm probably going to get there ahead of you. So I'll put in a good word for you. So um, she was very nice to be able to take on two cleaning positions and she's a full-time school teacher with Sachs. So that's very nice of her. Terry, is it possible for you to put in your information? I know it's on the screen for your PowerPoint, but could you also put it in the chat? Sure. Is that possible? Of course. That would probably really help people too, I think. Mm -hmm. And while Terry's doing that, everyone, if you have other questions, please go ahead. And Terry, yeah, we're short. Yeah, we're short of handyman too. So if you know of anybody who's at all handy, that would be helpful. And Terry, how many years have you been with CAP again? It'll be 32 in December. So like I said, it's hard for me. I never quit a job. Uh, so either you have to close the business <laughs> or I moved to Greece or something. You know, that's uh, that's been when I've quit before. So that's incredible. Thank you so much for all of that. So Erica, I'll let you continue. Jackie. Um, yeah, thank you, Terry. And um, I think we, we're going to try and keep you as long as we possibly can. <laughs> at Cap. So it's good to hear you're not planning on quitting anytime soon. Um, so I will speak about the rest of the um, nutrition and community services programs. So um, this is just a current picture of our food shelf uh, location in Shakopee. So that um, standard is our standard food shelf it's open Monday through Friday, eight to four. Um, we provide an immediate food and resources for those um, who are kind of food insecure at this point or needing to bridge that gap um, to get them through tough times. Um, we do many different things within the food shelf. So um, as Eric mentioned, we're moving to a new warehouse location that will double our size of our current food shelf. So um, with that, we are hoping to be able to open up again to in-person shopping, which our clients are, are missing dearly um, because we've been doing curbside pickup with online shopping orders um, since COVID began. So we're excited to have people back inside and be able to choose those foods for themselves. Um, in addition to our regular food shelf, we also have emergency food bags available for those who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so we do work closely with the housing team to ensure that those are available um, and that they can tailor those to what their client's specific needs are. Another service that we provide um, through the food shelf is our mobile food shelf, which we deliver to four senior housing buildings in Scott County once a month. Um, so we noticed through our senior nutrition program that um, they needed additional food support, but were unable to drive themselves um, or be able to shop themselves. So we began this program four years ago um, to be able to better support um, those who are unable to reach us. 
Um, our mobile food shelf also does deliver to anyone um, in Scott County who is having transportation issues, is ill due to COVID, um, or has mobility concerns. So unable to visit us, they can always call us or indicate on the online shopping form that they need um, delivery. And we don't want, we're trying to help uh, the barrier of transportation and that issue that we continuously hear from, from the clients that we serve. And then we also do pop-up food distributions. So these distributions are through a drive-through model. Um, we've been at various locations over the last year and a half um, from parks to church parking lots. Um, most recently this summer, we were in the Playworks um, parking lot at Mystic Lake Casino. In Chaska, we distribute at the old Gedney factory in their parking lot. So um, these happen once a month in Chaska and Shakopee, and then Burnsville is at Lavinia Church um, or the Vineyard Church in Burnsville every Monday from four to six. Um, and so these are food distributions where they have regular food items, um, frozen meats and dairy products, and then fresh produce. This is one of our, our senior clients in Jordan who is very excited. This was the first time we delivered um, our mobile food shelf to Schulhaus at the Jordan location. So happy to be able to help. Um, so senior nutrition provides um, affordable, well-balanced meals um, to elderly persons or those who are living in um, a senior housing building and are disabled. Um, so all of the meals have to meet certain components as this is a grant through Trellis, the Area Agency on Aging. So that is funded through the Older Americans Act. We do ask for a donation um, for meals. Um, currently we ask for a $5 donation. We do not refuse service if someone indicates that they're unable to pay or can't pay the full amount. So um, just depending on the senior's need, like Terry was talking about with the telephone reassurance, we do a nutrition assessment um, form to register them. Um, and then at that time, speak about what some other needs are, resources, and then um, how we can best help them at this time. So staff that work at those locations, we have 15 locations throughout the three counties. Um, and staff that work directly with those clients reach out regularly throughout the year to follow up and ensure that their needs are met. Great. So this is a program. I'm going to do another volunteer plug um, where we're always looking for more volunteer drivers. So if anyone is interested in delivering meals, um, it's very similar to Meals on Wheels. Um, feel free to reach out to, to me directly or fill out our volunteer interest form on our website. So currently we have the, the WIC grant. Um, I'm not sure if Others are aware, but that will be moving to um, Scott and Carver counties, um, public health departments as of January 1st, 2022. So WIC provides nutritious foods, counseling and healthy eating, breastfeeding support, and then healthcare referrals. Um, we also have our peer breastfeeding support program to help pregnant and new moms um, get started and going well with, with breastfeeding. So all of our WIC services have been um, over the phone since COVID began. So that is continuing um, through the middle of January for sure. We keep extending it by three months as the public health emergency um, gets extended. So if anyone is interested in WIC, it's for pregnant women um, and postpartum women up to six months or a year, and then children up to age five. Um, the value amount for it, they have an eWIC card, so very similar to EBT. Um, so it's much simpler to use um, rather than the old voucher system. Um, and usually a pregnant woman gets about $75 worth of food every month, and then children get about $50 worth of food. So feel free to fill out um, the interest form on our website or call their direct number um, there to sign up. Um, so our community projects are um, not necessarily grant-based, but through provided through donations, community support, um, and then small um, foundations and other uh, grants made available through the community resources. 
So Project Student Success provides backpacks with school supplies um, for pre-K through 12th grade uh, for any student that is utilizing one of our programs. Hope for the Holidays, which we just started advertising at the beginning of October. Um, we have four different um, holiday programs within that program is Adopt a Family, um, where families fill out a wish list form and we have community members that um, say they want to donate or sponsor a family of four. Um, and then we match them with a family in need and then provide them with that family's wish list. Um, toy distribution is where there are toy drives, um, toys for tots, all of those types of things, those come in to us. And then if anyone isn't able to register for adopt a family, um, we sign them up for toy distribution and then they can select from the gifts um, donated for their family. We also have adopt a senior, which provides um, every senior within our programs um, a reusable bag filled with toiletries, household items, um, all usable things that seniors are often asking for. And then we have our Eid celebration, which um, was the first annual celebration was this past May. Um, so celebrating the end of Ramadan. So um, it was very helpful to have Terry was part of that committee um, to get that going along with some members from our um, Justice Task Force or Alliance for Progress um, staff members within CAP that are kind of moving the, the needle forward in terms of justice. Um, and services provided within our service area. And then Esperanza is, um, was formerly a grassroots organization and it was acquired by CAP in June, 2020. Um, so Mary Hernandez is leading that effort as our community projects coordinator. Um, so she oversees the soccer camp, summer camp, um, and then cultural navigation for the Latino community to access various resources. So if someone is in need, um, they'll reach out to Mary and ask how she can um, access other services. Um, and part of that cultural navigation is um, we now have a contract with Scott County for um, Maritza to provide cultural navigation and translation at the Family Resource Centers, as Terry indicated. Um, and that is three days a week, um, every week at different locations within the county. And then prevention services is our crisis nursery program um, and parents helping parents. So crisis nursery is a 24 hour hotline um, that is the direct number listed. So um, it provides access to support resources and then emergency childcare. So whether someone needs to go to um, a court appointment or um, meet with a lawyer or go to a medical appointment, they don't have childcare. Um, reaching out to provide that emergency child care through our licensed um, child care providers um, that have been screened and trained um, based on our requirements. And then Parents Helping Parents is a support group that is co-led by parents in the community, um, monthly meetings in Shakopee and Chaska, and then soon to have a new location in Jordan. So we're working closely with the Family Wise program um, through the state to get those meetings back up and running and that new location starting in, in Jordan. And then I believe this is the last, <laughs> the last slide of mine, um, but Local Imports is the new name of our thrift store. Um, you can support CAP by shopping at our local import store um, or donating to our store. It's a great way to find unique items, shop green, local, and then in doing so, you're supporting all of our um, programs and our mission. So donations are accepted Monday through Friday from 8 to 4 and Saturdays from 10 to 3. Our store hours currently are Monday through Friday from 9 to 6 and then Saturday from 9 to 3. So um, our new location as of November 24th will be the former Pier 1 um, import store in Shakopee in the Southbridge area. Does anyone have any questions for me? Uh, this is Lloyd Erbach. Um, I'm just really interested in kind of briefly an overview of how many people on staff or volunteers are in uh, the various programs and projects that you described. 
Sure. So um, we have in our food shelf, there are three staff. Um, we have a manager and then two food shelf assistants. Um, in, well, Terry described SNAP, so I'll, I'll disregard that. Um, in WIC, we have eight staff currently um, that provide the WIC um, nutrition education support for families, and then three peer breastfeeding counselors. Um, let's see, senior nutrition, we have 10 employees, so a manager, and then nine direct staff that serve um, the 600 plus seniors within the three counties. Um, our local import store has um, a manager, an assistant manager, and then two part-time cashiers. Um, prevention services is led by Fina King. Um, she handles crisis nursery and parents helping parents. And then Mary Hernandez runs the community projects um, with the assistance of Maritza. Great, thanks. Yeah. Can I, can I jump in really quick, Jackie? Sure. This is Mary, Mary Hernandez. I wanted to also share that we do the pop-up food distributions and volunteers are always welcome. Mm -hmm. um, we are about to have our distribution here in Shakopee on October 29th. And we're coming back home at, we're gonna run it in Lions Park. And we'll be sending a link out to, to, to let the community know, but also to welcome volunteers as they're our backbone. Mary, yeah. do you do you want to put your information in the chat too? So in case someone would like to volunteer, um, they yeah. can find you right away. Of course, yep. I will put it on there. Thank you, Mary. Great to hear from Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, we have one question in the chat, and that is, can you nominate someone for the Adopt a Senior program? If so, what is the process? So um, yeah, currently, or in the past, we've um, restricted it to just our seniors that are part of our senior nutrition or chore program or a senior in our housing program or food shelf. Um, last year, we had over 700 um, adopt a senior gift bags donated to us, and we only had about 600 and some um, seniors within those programs. So if you do have someone that you would like to nominate for that program, please um, reach out to me directly. I'll put my email in the chat box um, and I can add them to the list for getting a bag out. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions, Jackie. Yes. One of them is, um, what are some of the greatest food items that you need for your food shelf? If people want to donate to the food shelf or if they want one of their faith communities or schools or whatever it may be to do a food drive for you, what would be some of those items that you really, really need? Sure. Um, we always appreciate the food drives that um, different organizations and schools will do because that often gives us a variety of items that we can't always purchase at um, Second Harvest or the food group, the local food banks. Um, so in a lot of the items that I'm listing are items that we have to purchase at a higher price. So um, macaroni and cheese, the canned tuna or canned chicken, uh, ready to eat soups. And also I would say any of like the individual um, items like individual packs of fruit or vegetables, um, ready to eat soup that has the pop top. A lot of those individual items or granola bars, those are things that we put in those um, emergency food bags that we provide to um, those that are experiencing homelessness. So we often have to pair those items, which are more expensive for us to purchase with disposable silverware, napkins, water, um, to be able to hand that out for people to eat that same day or within the next two days. So um, any of those items that you would probably normally put in like a children's lunch, those are all great items to add um, to a food drive for us. Great. And I would imagine that if someone is thinking, oh, I bet, I, you know, we would love to do that for you. They can just uh, contact you with your contact information in the chat. Is that correct? Yeah. Or I will put um, Kim's contact information. She's our food shelf manager. So she okay. coordinates all of the food drives. 
Um, so I will list her contact information as well. And then I'm going to ask the same kind of question regarding your, um, I'm sorry, what was the new name of your um, thrift store? Local, local imports. Local imports. Yeah. That sounds so fancy. <laughs> um, what are some of those items that um, you are looking for, especially as the winter is coming up, um, that people could donate to your um, store there as well? Yeah, so any of the um, clothing items, coats, uh, snow pants, hats, mittens, those are all hot commodities in the winter months, especially for children. Um, so if any, if you have any of those items that are gently used, so no holes or rips, um, things like that, feel free to donate those, as well as linens are a very common item that people come into thrift stores um, and shop for. So bedding, towels, washcloths, um, dishcloths, things like that. And then household items are another um, item that goes quickly in our store. As soon as we set something out, it is sold pretty much same day. Um, so any small appliances, toasters, microwaves, um, pots and pans, things like that are, are very common for people to come in and shop for. So we would appreciate any and all of those items, as well as if you aren't sure, feel free to either contact us um, directly or um, stop by during the donation hours and we can chat too. Perfect. And Mary, I think you just commented that ethnic food is very expensive. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Yes. Yes. Also, we, you know, when we do culture, culture um, appropriate products, they're so expensive. They're, they're, they're sometimes the food banks don't carry them. You know, and I think, Mary, if you want to send me a list of those foods, um, I will certainly do um, a fish community updates and needs and let people know that the food shelf is looking for um, ethnic food. And um, mm -hmm. I think that would be a great thing for people to know and to help out with, so. I will definitely talk to Jackie and Kim and send you a list, especially, you know, as the holidays come together and we sometimes are able to do Thanksgiving baskets or Christmas baskets that are a little more appropriate for certain families um, that we're able to serve. So I'll talk to my, my boss and Kim and we'll put a list together for you. Great, I'm excited about that, I love that. Perfect. Thank you. All right, Eric, who's next? We have Holly, who is our uh, director of Head Start. Great. Um, thank you, Eric. And Jackie, I'm just going to tell you when to switch the slide, if that's great. Good. So you can go ahead and switch to the first one. Um, as Eric said, I am Holly Schultz, and I am the director of Head Start and Education Services at the CAP Agency. Um, I've been with CAP for 22 years, but I am brand new into this role. Um, but I just wanted to share a little bit about the two programs that I support. So I support Head Start and also support Child Care Aware. So go ahead, Jackie. So our Head Start program, um, Eric kind of spoke to a little bit already about Lyndon Johnson and the war on poverty um, and how that brought about CAP. Well, that also brought about Head Start um, was a part of that as well. And so we the Head Start program is a national program that has been around for over 50 years. And so Head Start is a high quality early childhood program that is, supports children and families. And it um, is for low income families, it supports. So it is a federal program as well as um, we also, our program also receives state funding as well. So as I said, it's a free high quality preschool or home visiting experience for low income prenatal women and children ages zero to five. Our program provides support for the whole child. So when you're thinking about an early childhood program, we're looking at not only the education of the child, but we're also looking at um, the child's health and nutrition and the family support. What goals is the family working towards? Because we believe as a Head Start program that by supporting the whole child and all of the people around the child and all of their needs, it helps them to be more ready for school and going into kindergarten. So um, another really essential part of Head Start is parent engagement. It's very important to our program and it is encouraged through a variety of different opportunities that we give to parents. Parents are a part of our program planning. They help with policies and procedures. 
Um, they're part of a decision making as well, and they are included on a decision making um, council called policy council. So we nominate parents to represent other parents in the program, and they're a part of hiring, they're a part of, um, like I said, policies and procedures, they make approvals. So parents have a very big part of our program. Other ways that parents are a part of the program is through family events or field trips they can be a part of, um, home activities we do, possibly volunteering in the classroom, um, and just being a part of their child's education. We want parents to really understand um, their child and how they're learning and how they're growing so that they can also be advocates moving forward for their child as they move into um, their school career um, in the school district. So another part of our program that I wanted to share with you is that we do serve 341 children and families in Scott Carver and Dakota County. So we have 241 children in our classroom setting and we have 100 children and families that we serve in our early Head Start program, which I'll talk about next, Jackie. So we actually have two program options currently. Um, one is our early Head Start program. It's a home visiting program that serves pregnant women and children ages to, from zero to three. It really focuses on the parent-child relationship. Um, our family educators that go into the home to do those um, home visits, they really work with the parent to be their child's number one teacher. Um, as a Head Start program, even for our classrooms as well, we believe that parents are their child's number one teacher. We have a small time with them and we really want to empower parents to feel very um, good about their child's learning and feel confident in supporting their child in that. So our Early Head Start works with the parent to help work with their child in the home. They also really focus on health and wellness and supporting the family with that. Early Head Start meets one time per week in the home with the family educator. And then they also do two parent socializations uh, twice a month. So. Um, I'm sorry, not two twice a month, once twice a month. So they do two a month. So they, um, right now it, it has varied a little bit with the pandemic. Um, we were doing some things virtual. We are trying to get back to in-person, um, but they will come together as a family, maybe do some training, maybe just they go to the park together. They may um, go to the zoo, take a field trip, but it's an opportunity then for the children and the families to have some social time together. Our Head Start program, is a preschool education program serving children ages three to five. Um, so our children have to be three years old by September 1st to come into our program. And then they move on then into the kindergarten because that's also for kindergarten, they have to be five by September 1st to go to kindergarten. Um, our pro program offers not only education, but as I was saying, the whole child. So we support health, wellness guidance and family support while preparing children for school readiness. So we have our classrooms that um, have a teacher, an assistant teacher and an aide to support the children in the classroom. Then we also have a health coordinator, um, a nutrition coordinator. We have um, mental health consultants that help support us with any mental health concerns that may be happening. And then we also have family service coordinators who are working with the parent to set parent goals and to support parents. So that might be anything from a parent is looking for a new job. Maybe they're wanting to go back to school as a goal. Um, maybe it's looking for housing. So they're helping to support those parents with those goals as a way to help support the entire um, family, which also supports that child then moving forward with their school readiness. So Head Start provides children with learning opportunities in a classroom setting where Early Head Start is a home visiting program. We currently have nine classroom sites um, across Scott Carver and Dakota County. As you can see, they're listed there, everything from as far as Chaska on the west side all the way to West St. Paul on the east side of the kind of southern suburbs of the Twin Cities. Um, we have two program options for the classroom, which we have two, two of our classrooms, the one in Shakopee and in um, Apple Valley are three and a half hours. So they have actually double session, which has a morning class and an afternoon class. And then we also have the other classrooms have seven and a half hours. Um, our site that's in Savage actually has four classrooms. So we have 12 classrooms total that are available for families. Okay, go ahead, Jackie. Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to share a little bit about how to apply for Head Start. So sometimes we take referrals from other agencies, but um, if a parent wants to apply, they can look at our website for more information. Um, they can actually complete the application online as well. Um, so that's our crapagency.org. Um, another way is to call our Rosemont office and request an application to be sent to you. 
tasks. And so with that as well, we can help answer questions or help complete the application as well. If a parent's struggling or they're maybe having some issues with completing it, we can help support that. Um, otherwise, we're not quite open right now because of COVID, but um, when we are typically, uh, anyone could stop into the office and get an application as well. So, um, you know, with our program, as I said, you know, really supporting the whole child, we really want to do as much as we can to support the community. I just wanted to share kind of a little story for with you with Head Start. Um, we had a family in our program last year. The child was in our program. She came into our program with her um, mother had been incarcerated. And so the family was dealing with that as well as with um, that she was now living with her grandparents. And so as a program, by looking at the whole child, we were supporting that child um, and the family with resources that they maybe needed at that time, as well as supporting that child in the classroom with um, the, the sadness she was feeling and missing her mom and helping her deal with that in the classroom, as well as supporting her learning and helping her grandparents to support her learning and receive any resources that they needed. Well, over time, um, mom returned back home. And um, at that time, then we helped mom who had some goals where she wanted to go back to school and was looking for a job and had a goal of having her own home versus living with her parents. And um, over time, over a year of us working with her, with our family service coordinator and the teachers and um, our health coordinator helping support the family. We worked together where in the end, when the child was ready to go on to kindergarten, not only was the child ready for kindergarten, but mom had been promoted at her job as well as she was um, in the midst of having and owning her own home. Um, so it's just really, that's what our goal is. We're working towards self-sufficiency and helping children be prepared for school and for life going forward. So is there any questions about Head Start before I move on to Child Care Aware? I guess I can add one other thing. Um, I know that both Eric and Con or Eric and Jackie both talked a lot about um, possible ways to help support the program. We are always looking for donations as well. Um, we do look for volunteers too. I will say right now, um, because of the pandemic, we are not having volunteers come into the classroom just because children are not vaccinated at this point. So we're doing all we can to reduce exposure for children. But typically we would encourage volunteers that wanted to help and support the classroom. So I'm hoping we can get back to that. Um, but for donations, we're always looking for, like Jackie said, clothing, winter gear for children. We're looking for the snow pants, snow boots, hats and mittens, coats, um, also uh, books. We always like to try and provide as much we can for books or education supplies for children um, as well. And um, some of the other things that we find really helpful are gas cards for our parents, um, just to help support transportation and getting their children back and forth to school or making it to dental appointments or physical appointments and the different things they need to do for their families. So just wanted to share that too. Okay, if no questions, we'll do Child Care Aware. So the other program I support is Child Care Aware. Um, Child Care well Aware is helping children exceed in school and life by supporting the professional growth of early childhood educators and connecting families to quality childcare. So Child Care Aware is a resource and it helps support, it's a support-based service. So in, in the counties of Scott and Carver, um, we support up to about 500 child cares in the area. So it could be a center-based child care as well as a home-based child care. Um, it's helping parents by providing information about the value of quality child care. Um, providing resources and toolkits to help parents so that they can choose the right child care situation for their family. So that's done through our Parent Aware piece, and you can see there's the um, website for Parent Aware. Actually, our Head Start program is a four-star rated Parent Aware program as well. So we're kind of connected in that way with Child Care Aware and Parent Aware. Um, we support child care educators in building the quality of their programs by offering professional development opportunities, training, grants, and scholarship programs. So we have coaches on our team that will go in and help support those child care educators to continue with quality and, like I said, training and other things that they need to keep providing quality care for children. Um, we also support child care programs by inviting them to earn a parent aware star rating. And that was what I was speaking about with Head Start being a four star rating there. Um, the program, our program is helping support other child cares, whether it be a family child care that's in the home or it might be a center base to help them get their um, four star rating or two star or three star rating, depending on the qualifications that they're trying to meet. Um, we support the community in being present at the table. So really, Child Care Aware is really an advocate. It's trying to help support early childhood education and care and advocate 
for better services and quality services for the families and children in our community. Next slide. Thanks, Jackie. <laughs> So and just to share, uh, Child Care Aware Services have been available for a very long time in Scott and Carver counties for over 40 years. Um, we work in partnership with other programs to help support the needs of children and families, um, making sure that they're being heard and responded to in a manner that strengthens our communities and individuals. Um, right now, I wanted to add, we have our website here that you can check us out online, as well as our phone number here. Our current manager is Marie Johnson. And I'm sure that if you had any other questions for her, she certainly would be willing to answer those for you. And I could certainly pass those along. I will put my information in the chat as well. So anyone is very welcome to um, speak to me or reach out to me and I can certainly help with that. So with that, I wanted to make sure we were done on time there. So I kind of went through quickly. I know I'm a fast talker. So does anybody have any other questions or anything that I can do to answer anything for you? Holly, um, while I am kind of wrapping things up with a couple last announcements, why don't you put your information in the chat also? So if Will they it? do have extra questions or want to connect with you, um, they can do it easily. I know it's probably on your slide, but I think the chat's easier for some people just to copy and paste and save and all that good stuff. So thank you so much. Thank you, That's Eric nice. and Jackie and Terry and Holly for, for all the work you do and for all your information. I mean, time just flew this morning, um, hearing about everything that you guys do and, and the good work that you do in the community. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I know that we are running short on time, but I do wanna share this with you. Um, that our second Thursday meeting in November is going to be November 18th. And so if you see that in yellow, it's because we have moved it because of Veterans Day. So mark your calendar if you tune in the um, second Thursday, November, maybe I'll be here just to say good morning to you, but uh, we will not have a program. So um, it will be November 18th and we will have our other community partner, which is the CDA, um, talking about all the programs they have available and what they are doing to help people be homeowners um, and just learn that process of um, having a job and owning a home and, and all the things that they do for um, Scott County as well. So um, I think we have one minute left. So if there's anybody that has any fast announcements about anything they're doing or anything they'd like to let everybody know, now is your chance. Okay, well, with that being said, um, thank you so much once again for our speakers. Everyone check the chat while I'm chatting just a little bit longer to make sure you get all that information. We will send out hopefully the PowerPoint. Um, and also a recap of today's meeting. So if anyone missed anything or want to go back and refresh their memories, you'll be able to do that. So thank you everybody for um, zooming in and we will see you in November. Bye-bye everybody. Thanks, Bethany, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, Bethany. Thank you. Nice to see you, Eric. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. Anytime. Good to see you tuned in, Michelle. Oh, she left already. Okay. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Again. <laughs>